a pleasure to have Professor Aparna Bhaskaran as today's speaker. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the fifth talk in the webinar series on statistical physics that is being organized by SNBOS Center. Uh, Aparna is a very well-known researcher specializing in the field of soft matter, active matter. She is from Brandeis University. Uh, she obtained her PhD from Florida University in 2006, and then she did a postdoc uh, in Syracuse University. Uh, and since 2010, she has joined his present, present position in Brandeis University. Uh, her group has made many useful research contribution in the field of uh, active matter uh, and particularly uh, uh, explaining pattern formation and uh, various type of phase transitions that take place in this kind of systems. She is also the recipient of prestigious Early Career Award in Soft Matter Research, awarded by American Physical Society in 2019. Uh, and as Aparna said, she would invite questions during her talk. So I would encourage particularly the students to ask questions, uh, interact with the speaker. And uh, today she is going to tell us about active matter, applying the materials physics paradigm to biology. Over to you, Aparna. You are muted, Oporna. Uh, once I start sharing screen, my setup is such that when I'm on Google Meet, I can't see you guys at all. So what you should do is unmute yourself and yell at me. Okay? It's super useful for me to be yelled at when I'm speaking and I'm not attached to getting to the last slide or anything else like that. So go ahead and interrupt me. Once I start sharing screen, I can't see any of you. I can only see my slides. Okay? I am going to start sharing screen. Uh, let's get uh, started with what I plan to say. As uh, Shakuntala told us, we're talking about uh, active matter in this talk, which is what I've been spending most of my last 10 years thinking about. And the scope of what I want to tell you guys today about is to start with a little bit of context. What is active matter? Why do we care? Things like that. Then I'll try to spend the bulk of the talk telling a pedagogical story. I will be talking about hydrodynamics of active pneumatics, but I will tell it in a way that everybody who is a, a physics student at some level should be able to understand. So that is the part in which you should feel free to interrupt wherever you like and see if I can help explain whatever it is I'm saying better. Then we'll transition into a show and tell and coming attract attraction session where I'll be talking about, you know, uh, actual papers that are either recently written or that are going to be written soon. That will be somewhat technical and, you know, you may be quite unhappy with it. And then you can, you know, just go to sleep for those five, ten minutes of the talk. And then we'll conclude with some um, overview of what we went through in this talk. OK, let's get started. So what is active matter? This is a field that got started when physicists watched videos that look like this. And the physicists happened to be statistical physicists. And when they saw these videos, they did not see beautiful starling murmurations or uh, fish schools responding to predators. What they saw was local interactions between particles with long range order in my system. And that, as statistical physicists, we know how to do. Local interactions giving rise to long range order is what is called phase transitions. So all of these guys must be flying spins. Let's take a model where we just take an IC, uh, XY model and uh, make them move around. And that's what the flocking behavior should be about. And this was the first paper on this topic by Vichek et al. that got, it, got this field started. But subsequently, over the last uh, 20 years or so, it has gone on to encompass very different systems. So the video on the over here is cytoplasmic streaming in a oocyte cell where various activities of the cytoskeleton are setting up large scale flows. This is a crawling neutrophil that is going to capture a, an E. coli. This guy is uh, swarming bacteria on an agar substrate. 
And this is the experiment from Ajay Sood's group where you have a monolayer of uh, granular particles that are sitting on a vibrated plate. Now, I want to be able to describe all of these systems within the same language that I want to use to describe birds and bees and whatever. And the way you describe all of this using the same mathematical language is to take the following perspective. What you have is a material made out of microscopic engines. Instead of a material made out of atoms that is then used to construct engines, you just have a material made out of engines. There are lots of Carnot's engines that are all coupled to each other and talking to each other. And these engines are all coupled to each other through local interactions. Namely, an engine over here does not have a way to talk to an engine all the way over there. It can only talk to its neighbors. Again, as StatMac people, we know that that is enough. And what happens is that they collectively do work on some much larger length scale. I have some small motor proteins in here that are pushing and pulling on some filaments, but I'm able to set up a flow on this much larger length scale. Again, there are teeny tiny motor proteins on the nanometer length scale doing something, but I'm accomplishing something that is this whole cell crawling. So that kind of thing. So this is the paradigm that unifies all these diverse systems into this one name called active matter. Now, why should we care about this system? There are a number of different reasons, but first let me try to make this case that we don't actually know how to think about it. When I take this uh, traditional non-equilibrium system, that is a system that I would have, as a non-equilibrium StatMac person, studied if I had been born 20 years earlier than I was born, I would be thinking of a sheared fluid. A sheared fluid is a system where I'm driving the system at the macro scale. What do I mean by that? I'm shearing the fluid at the walls. The length scale over which I'm imposing the shear is much, much larger than the length scale associated with the collisional dynamics of the microscopic entities. And what happens in the system is that the energy cascades down. I drive it at the longest length scale and the collisions among the molecules cascades the energy down to the microscopic length scale in the form of temperature. And thermodynamics gives me a handle on how to think about this and how this actually happens. All of our considerations that come from a standard thermodynamics course that we learn are associated with systems such as this one. But for the systems that I was trying to describe on the previous slide, what's happening is that I'm driving it at the micro scale. As I mentioned, each molecule is an engine. So each molecule has a hot bath and a cold bath coupled to it and it's doing work. So I'm driving it at the micro scale and the energy cascades up rather than cascade down. And therefore, the math that we know how to do is not going to be super useful. So we have to invent more math and uh, identify the rules of the game and design principles associated with this inverse energy cascade. Now, focusing on the why do we care bit, for a moment, let me put on a theoretical physicist hat and ask why should I care about this problem? I care about this problem as a theoretical physicist because I get to invent new math. I don't have a constraint of equilibrium anymore. If I have a normal material, if I let the material go, if I stop driving the material, it has to go to thermodynamic equilibrium. That constraint goes away. When that constraint goes away, everything we know how to do about non-equilibrium is not true. Fluctuation dissipation is not true. Regression is not true. Pretty much everything that one knows is not true anymore. And when you're liberated from all these constraints, you can have a bunch of new physics. For example, long range order in 2D, the thing that made uh, Toner and Two famous, anomalous fluctuations, the thing that made Sri Ram Ramaswamy famous, novel instabilities and pattern formation, which all of us little people have been working on over the past several years. So there's a lot of new physics that comes out. And then you are wear a real person's hat and you say, I'm a taxpayer. Why are you using my money to do this research? Then the answer to that person would be that all of this active matter is the physical scaffold of biological systems. You take any biological system, be it you or me or my cell or uh, bacteria crawling on um, some uh, agar substrate. These are all active materials. And what they have on top of the active material idea of microscopic uh, driving is biochemical regulation. And what one can do by studying these systems is one of two things. We can design materials that have biology-like properties, things that are adaptive, things that are self-healing, materials like that. 
and secondly we can identify interventions for unpleasant things that biology does these are the people who work with cancer biologists and people like that to try to understand how a metastatic tumor stress distribution is different from a non metastatic tumor the fingering instability that leads to your cancer spreading and things like that i belong in the first category i couldn't care less about uh, biology or what lives or what dies but i would be cool to make a shirt if i tear it it just heals itself so that kind of thing want materials that uh, are adaptive and self healing and so on okay i hope i have made a case for what what the class of systems i'm studying is and why they are interesting now let me give you a sample materials physics goal i was saying okay i want to make materials that have life like properties right so let's quantify that into one goal that we can set for ourselves i want to make myself one of these smart bags this neutrophil crawling behind the e coli i don't care that it's a neutrophil and it's crawling behind an e coli or anything i want to think of it as a smart bag it's a bag with some stuff in it but under the presence of an appropriate chemical gradient that bag will start moving and it will go in the direction i want it to go that's the property that i want my system to have and if i think of this as a mechanical problem i want a bag of stuff that moves then i can this movie that i'm showing you right now is from the 1950s it was made by uh, this guy dave rogers at vanderbilt university but now given all of the technology we have right now you can make much fancier movies and so in 2018 in genelia farms this exact same well not the exact same that cell is dead right but an exact same neutrophil imaging was done where in purple you're seeing the actin and in uh, green you're seeing the myosin and what i would like you to notice is that at the rear so this cell is moving in that direction okay and at the rear end of the cell you can see all this myosin motors are getting accumulated while at the front end of the cell it's the actin polymerization dynamics that is predominant and the cortex is spreading and this large contraction at the rear end and large extension at the front end is what is resulting in the global displacement of the cell it's resulting in the motility of the cell now that i know what is happening in terms of uh, forces and stresses and so on can i make me one of these now let's abstract this out a little bit beyond this simple this particular system of actin and myosin and a cell and things like that and ask what is the general um, ingredients i need general infrastructure i need i need the same microscopic ingredients to be able to dynamically and adaptively reorganize that is what i need to get function the cytoskeleton of the cell always has the same proteins it has the microtubules it has the microtubule associated proteins it has actin it has the actin associated proteins but then that material is able to dynamically and adaptively reorganize to do whatever the cell needs to do right it can organize so that the cell is crawling it can organize so that the cell is dividing it's basically this dynamic and adaptive reorganization is what allows my material to acquire function so that's one thing that i want then the second thing that i want is i need spatio temporally programmable internal stress i need to be able to tell my bag oh you should have large contractile stress at the back end of the bag you should have a large extensile stress at the front end of the bag or some other thing like that and what is front end and what is back back end changes as a function of time so i need to be able to program the stress in space and time so this is the big picture objective that uh, one wants to work towards let's say as a materials physics goal in active matter now i so this is all big picture context right i'm telling you like in broad strokes what uh, is interesting and why we are doing it now i want to transition into a pedagogical story now this part of the story should be something that is like a like a class right if you're taking a class on hydrodynamics so you're taking a class on non equilibrium statmec it should be at that level i should be able to tell you the story clearly so feel free to interrupt if uh, i can say what i'm saying better than i'm saying what i want to do is i want to write down a theoretical description for a collection of interacting units that are producing forces right because each of my microscopic entities are engines they are producing forces so i need to write a theory for a collection of interacting units that produce forces there are a number of ways of writing this theory but in this talk i want to try to spend my time on a theoretical approach where i don't care about the particular microscopics what do i mean by that imagine that i have water 
And what I'm trying to do is write down a mathematical model that says how much pressure gradient should I set so that I get a flow rate of a given value in a pipe. To be able to write down a mathematical theory to do that calculation, I don't need to know anything about hydrogen bonding. I don't need to know anything about the fact that water is made of hydrogen and oxygen and whatever it has uh, electric dipole. I don't need any of that information. The only information I need to be able to write a theory that tells me a pressure gradient will result in a flow is hydrodynamics. I just need Euler's equations. So that is the attitude we want to take towards active matter in this part of the talk. And to be able to take this attitude, we need two pieces of information. The first piece of information is the classification based on symmetry. And that breaks down into two parts. I have to talk about the symmetry of activity. So activity is some force generated by my microscopic entity. Now I have some blob-like structure and it's generating some forces all around it. So I can think about a force distribution on the surface. For a moment, think about what you would do in ENM. You have some object and there's some charge distribution on that object. What would you do? You'd expand that charge distribution in multipoles, right? You'll ask, is the monopole non-zero? What is the dipole? What is the quadrupole? And so on. You'll expand the charge distribution in uh, dipole, in uh, moments, right? The exact same thing you do for activity. And you say, oh, if the monopole is the leading order term, then I'm going to call that system polar. If the dipole is the leading order term, I'm going to call that system pneumatic. If the quadrupole is a leading order term, we can call it something else. So you just categorize your system by taking multiple moments of the force distribution. So that's one symmetry-based categorization. And the second symmetry-based categorization you need is the symmetry of interactions. What do I mean by that? I mean that if two particles come together, it is possible that um, it's possible that when they come together, the forces that they are exerting don't change at all. They come together and they keep running into each other, for example. That would be an isotropic interaction where the interaction does not influence the active stresses at all. Or if you're a bird or a bee, if you come together like this, you're not going to keep running into each other. You're going to turn so that you become parallel. That would be an example of a polar interaction where the active forces are getting realigned by the interaction. So that's the second symmetry, the symmetry of the interactions. If you put these two symmetries together, you can come up with classes of active materials that you can build, and people have built these. For example, if I imagine a polar drive, namely that the force is a monopole, and isotropic interactions, namely if two guys come together, they just keep running into each other, that would be the standard active Brownian particle model that a number of people have studied, including me. And an experimental realization would be these Janus colloids that are made of like PMMA particles with some metallic uh, coating on one side. This guy is platinum, that guy is gold. And you immerse it in hydrogen peroxide so that there's a catalytic reaction that happens on the metal side of my particle and that sets up marangoni flows that propels these uh, colloids so that's a system that you can make that have these symmetries if supposing you decided you wanted polar drive and polar interactions then the system that you can make is a motility assay this motility assay is a system where you take a glass cover slip and you stick motor proteins on that cover slip then on top of it, you put polymers that are associated with that motor protein. So what happens is the motor protein grabs the polymer and tries to walk, but it's stuck. So it cannot walk. It will end up propelling the filament. So that is an example of a polar drive, polar interaction systems. Under some circumstances, bacterial systems, such as the uh, this one is Bacillus subtilis from the Hong Kong people. Uh, these also form polar drive, polar interaction systems. But the story I will tell you today will be the one that is for pneumatic drive, pneumatic interactions. And basically what we mean is that the force is dipolar. It pushes in both directions of its body axis. And there is an aligning interaction that tends to align these dipoles parallel to each other. This particular system, there are many, many realizations of uh, uh, the system. For example, uh, Ajay Su, the Nara and Menon have been doing experiments with vibrated monolayers of granular rods. The cytoskeletal filament motor protein system, which is what uh, my bread and butter is, I'll tell you more about that, belongs in this category. You can make bacteria swim in chromatin liquid crystals. This is a set of experiments pioneered by Oleg Lavrentovich. It belongs in this category. And there are a bunch of French people leading among them is Pascal Silberzan, but a number of them who look at epithelial cell sheets. 
and these guys also belong in this category and the hong kong people are bacteria on substrate so there is a wide range of experimental systems that people have built that the theory i'm going to describe is applicable for and the particular system that i work with the system that we have at brandeis we just call it the brandeis pneumatic or the dogic pneumatic is composed of the following ingredients it has microtubules microtubules for our purposes let's assume all of us are theorists and we don't care about anything in the real world for our purposes this microtubule is a rod and that's it we don't care about anything else uh, these microtubules are bundled together using some bundling agent the bundling agent can be something non specific like a depletant that basically just brings rods together from depletion interaction or it can be something specific in uh, microtubule associated proteins that will tend to bring microtubules together then finally the last ingredient is a motor protein it's a motor protein that is engineered to have heads on both sides and it tends to walk on the microtubules and what this little arrangement of things does is if there are two microtubules like this it will unzip the microtubules it push the microtubule this way so if you look at a time lapse image of a couple of microtubules what you should be able to see is they come together they extend they extend they extend they extend they extend and then they fall apart so basically what's happening is they're coming together like this they're doing this 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 and eventually fall apart that is the basic microdynamics of this so this composite object that i'm talking about microtubule motor protein bundler is my agent is the engine okay and what this engine does is exert this force dipole now one of the first experiments that was done with this was you centrifuge these things these little um stretchy filaments onto an oil water interface so you just put this stuff in a cup you centrifuge it so that it settles down onto an oil water interface and if you do that what it does is this this is the ice cream churning dynamics that happens to an active pneumatic in 2d now what i'm going to do in the next few slides is to try to tell you the mathematical language that one would use to describe the dynamics we are seeing in this movie okay now i'm going to pause for a moment and see if people want to yell at me about all of the big picture stuff we talked about so far before we launch into some equations i have a question go for it yeah so there are systems in which although the drive is polar the interactions are pneumatic uh, okay uh, so can you say something about those systems what does it mean say something about those systems like, the phenomenology uh, is different right if the drive was polar and the interactions yes. were pneumatic for example self propelled rods and things like that those would be the cases where the phenomenology would be different right the, so i would have uh, uh, it will be it will belong to a different symmetry class than the systems i showed so the defects there would be although they would be expected to be polar they would see plus half and minus half kind of defects in such systems right yes okay yes okay. there uh, it, it's it turns out it depends so it is possible under very very high activity circumstances to get polar like defects in a system where the interactions are actually pneumatic but under most circumstances your intuition is exactly right namely that the interactions determine the charge of the defect not so much the uh, symmetry of the activity okay thank you other questions or comments that was a very technical uh, i had a this person should be bored right now yes sorry go ahead yeah what's the scale bar on this video that's playing on the screen um okay i i don't know how to show it can you see my mouse yeah 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 no nah, so that no, hand, actually, the, width, the width of that hand is about 1 micron okay okay so uh, the reason i asked is uh, like the the motors that will be like you know uh, separating the filaments they will be uh, of the size of nanometers right and uh, yes. at that length scale there will be a lot of noise that will be uh, affecting the directionality of that process i guess but yeah. uh, directionality of the motor stepping or directionality of this extending thing the directionality of the the, the two filaments uh, getting separated uh, okay. is 
no i i am just like uh, curious that like you know uh, i am seeing some correlated motion in very la much larger length scale than, than the where the motors are converting the chemical energy into mechanical energy so yes. uh, i was just curious about like uh, like uh, how this noise is being rectified into such uh, you know uh, uh, because i am seeing least, much something very collective as absolutely. compared to so you you uh, your intuition is bang on namely that there's something very noisy happening at the scale of the motor that is being that is uh, being averaged not so much rectified but averaged into yes, something yes. that is very smooth and very boring apparently at some much longer length scale to the extent that we know anything right now it's just excluded volume interactions that are organizing the effective stress right because okay. the rods cannot do anything except align and this is at very high density that is what is organizing the the forces right all right but the fluctuations at the level of the motors namely that oh if there are many motors there will be few atp maybe the motor will bind maybe it won't bind blah 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 yes. those kinds of things are also important but we don't know anything about them there are different experiments where people are trying to understand how all of this crap happens but i think they don't know at this moment okay 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 thanks a lot is that helpful yeah 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 thanks okay other comments okay the people that discussed with me so far are very sophisticated people right so all of the things that i said in my talk so far these people would find obvious but there i'm hoping that there are students that would think that whatever i've told you so far is useful to place in this context right so you guys can speak up if you want to for now i'm going to launch into all of the math so i want to write the mathematical description for this guy and the mathematical description is basically the following i say okay there is some force dipole that is living in some dissipative environment and when two force dipoles come together they are like if i just take these two ingredients then what i have is a hydrodynamic description that is composed of three variables the first variable is the density of particles these microtubules are not making babies or dying or anything else like that so the total number of microtubules in my system is conserved then i have this pneumatic order parameter which is basically saying okay i'm going to sit in some region in space and ask what is the orientational order in that region in space acknowledging for the fact that the head and the tail are symmetric if the head and the tail were not symmetric if i had an arrow this orient pneumatic uh, this orientational order is just some angle theta which direction is that arrow pointing now all you have to do is you have to make sure that theta and minus theta look the same so instead of using cos theta you use cos 2 theta that's my pneumatic order parameter and then finally i have a fluid velocity field these things move and induce flows so there's some fluid velocity that i have to keep track of now what i want to describe briefly is how one would go about trying to write down the hydrodynamic description in terms of these mathematical variables so let's start with an equilibrium pneumatic fluid an equilibrium pneumatic fluid is uh, let's say it's the pneumatic that is there on my computer screen if it was 10 years ago right now the technology is different but it's the uh, uh, liquid crystal displays that we all know and love and in that case what you would do is you have some order parameter and you want to write some dynamics for that order parameter all you will do is you'll say okay there is some free energy the order wants to roll down the hill in that free energy so i just write down gradient descent dynamics i just say the time derivative of that order parameter it just goes downhill in that free energy landscape this is what our statmac people would call model a dynamics that's basically what you would write down if you had an equilibrium pneumatic fluid now let's take an equilibrium pneumatic fluid again this thing in my computer screen or something else like that and impose inhomogeneous flow so imagine that i have this pneumatic here and i'm just imposing a flow where there is large flow here small flow here large flow here or something like that and just imposing some flow in my system then what should happen let's uh, answer that question by asking what should happen to a rod like particle in some inhomogeneous flow as this little cartoon is suggesting to us when there is an inhomogeneous flow across a rod not only will the rod be convected with the flow it will turn because the flows will be exerting torques on the rod it will turn and this dynamics of a rod in an imposed flow is something that jeffrey wrote down in 1913 so a long time we've had the equation that tells me what happens when i put a rod in an inhomogeneous flow its center of mass 
gets convected with the fluid velocity and its orientation, that is this axis, gets rotated. It gets rotated by the flows, gradients in the flows. And this H guy is the aspect ratio. How skinny is this rod compared to its length? And you use that to determine how well it will turn. You can imagine that if it's a sphere, it's not going to turn at all. And if it's a really, really skinny rod is when it's going to turn well. You just include that uh, that piece of information in here. These things are called Jeffrey's equations and they have been written down for more than 100 years at this point. So we just take this well-studied equation to say this is what will happen if I took a pneumatic and imposed an externally homogeneous flow on it. So you just take these equations, coarse grain them to see what will happen to Q and what you'll get for Q is this equation. It gets convected with the flow, it gets rotated with the flow, it gets shear aligned with the flow, and all of that is happening on top of the gradient descent dynamics that we already put. So all this is saying is that the, the rod that forms the pneumatic will just move with the flow, turn with the flow, etc. And all and the interactions among the rods will still drive the gradient descent dynamics of my system. So that's the theory you would write down for Q. Now what I need to do for my active pneumatic is write an equation for the flow. Because... In the passive pneumatic case, the only way there will be flow is if somebody drives it, right? I have to be God and stick a spoon in my pneumatic and turn it. But for the active pneumatic case, it will generate its own flow because it's exerting forces. So I need to write an equation for the flows generated by the active pneumatic itself. And for that, the starting point is again Navier-Stokes, right? You'll start with, okay, if I was to write an equation for the momentum, the equation should be Navier-Stokes. Now, what do I need to add to this equation? I first of all need to add a reaction stress. What do I mean by that? I mean that if I put a rod inside a fluid, the fluid cannot be where the rod is. So the presence of the rod will exert a stress on the fluid just because there is excluded volume interaction that prevents the fluid from being where the rod is. That is called the reaction stress. And the reaction stress is typically figured out by requiring that the system be dissipated. So this is technical. Basically, you write down an energy that you want to be monotonic in time and you use that to determine what the reaction stress is. I have no way that this equation will make sense without us spending a little time with it, but I don't care. So I'm going to throw this reaction stress out and not worry about it for the purposes of uh, today's talk. But instead, I want to focus on another piece of information that we need to add, which is very relevant, is to take particles that are exerting forces and ask what is the force exerted by these particles on the fluid because of these active forces. You can see that each particle is a force dipole. And therefore, if I decided to write what is the stress in any given region because of these force dipoles, you should be able to convince yourself that the stress has to be proportional to how ordered these force dipoles are. If these force dipoles are pointing in random direction, the forces will cancel and there will be no stress. If they are all nicely ordered, there will be large stress. So this stress has to be proportional to the pneumatic order. right? So you take that definition for my active stress and you add it to your Navier-Stokes equations. Now, once you add the active stress to the Navier-Stokes equation, the system will start flowing for free. You don't have to do anything to the system from outside. So that is a description we want to use. And what we will do is we'll throw out the inertial part of the dynamics. These things are very, very low Reynolds number. So we'll throw the inertial part of the dynamics and just use a Stokes equation. So the mathematical description I want to use to describe that movie we spent some time looking at and talking about is this set of equations where I have this... Uh, pneumatic director that is undergoing gradient descent dynamics in some free energy landscape but is rotated and translated by the flow. I have a Stokes equation and I have incompressibility. This is the set of equations I want to use. Now again for the purposes of pedagogy instead of spending my time with this equation I want to use a set of cartoons to try to describe what is the physics that uh, these equations contain. The cartoons I want to use are as follows. Imagine there is a perfectly ordered region in my pneumatic fluid. All the dipoles are arranged in straight lines. So there are, okay, at this point, you can convince yourself that in the bulk, in the ordered region, there will be no net force because the guys pushing up will be balanced by the guys pushing down. All of the forces will cancel here. And the only forces that will be left will be at the edge of the domain, that this guy will be pushing out and this guy will be pushing down, right? And Newton's third law will say that the rest of the universe will push back on these guys. And so the perfectly ordered domain is a mechanical equilibrium. All the forces are balanced and that domain should stay there forever. 
Now let's imagine that these domains bend a little bit. Let's set up a bend distortion in my domain. What do I mean by that? In this context, all of my little force dipoles were lined up in a straight line. Now, when I say there is a bend deformation, I'm not bending any one guy. I'm just bending the line in which they are arranged so that there's a little bit of a distortion in that system. Now, if I ask what is the net force exerted by this domain on the rest of the universe, you should be able to do trigonometry and decide that there exists a net force in this direction exerted by this domain on the rest of the universe. Yes, if that is true, the rest of the universe will exert an equal and opposite force on me. So all of this other stuff that I am not considering will exert a green force on me. And moment the green force is exerted on me, I will start moving in that direction. So the moment there is a bend distortion, the whole region will start moving in the direction of the bend distortion, right? And the other thing that you can also convince yourself of quite easily is that I have some thing that is pushing into the walls. So imagine you have a ruler, a big scale, a meter scale that you're pressing into the wall. If you press, if you continue to press into the wall, it will buckle more, right? The exact same thing will happen here. This bend distortion will buckle more and it will buckle and buckle and buckle until such time that its buckling will result in any one rod bending. And you can't bend one rod. Those are rigid rods. And therefore what happens is that this distortion grows and grows until you end up with these objects that are called topological defects. Basically, the bend distortion bent until such time as you have to bend one rod. These things are called plus and minus half defects. This was the topological defects and the charge of the topological defects that was mentioned in the little discussion we had when we were thinking about the symmetries a little earlier. And what you have is this is basically the physics in the equation. You have these um, perfectly aligned domains that are uh, force balanced. If you put a little bend distortion, then there is an instability that causes the formation of this defect. Okay. Now, what I've tried to tell you in cartoons is the phenomenology that is there for the, for the rods. What, do, what are the rods doing in these equations? Let's for a moment consider what the fluid is doing or what the rest of the rods that are not in this monodomain are doing. To understand that, let's take a plus minus defect pair. So let's take uh, this configuration. That is what is represented here. This is the core of the defect and these lines are how the order is away from the defect. And let's put this configuration inside the Stokes equation and just solve the Stokes equation to see what the flow looks like. And if you solve the Stokes equation, then the flow looks like this. What is plotted here in colors is the vorticity in the flow. And when you see a bright blue region, you have a strong clockwise vortex. When you have a bright pink region, it's a strong anti-clockwise vortex. So what you can see is that when you have a plus half defect, you have two counter-rotating vortices on either side, while for a minus half defect, you have six counter-rotating vortices arranged around it. Okay? This is what the flow in the vicinity of a defect is. Now let's take this seriously for a moment and ask, what are we saying? We are saying that the plus half defect is performing a breaststroke. It's swimming like this by pushing the fluid around like that. And if the fluid gets pushed around like this, what's going to happen? These rods that are standing up will start bending, right? Because this fluid is pushing them in this direction, these guys will start bending. And if they start bending, what should happen is I should get counter-oriented plus minus defect pairs in the vicinity of this guy. That is the basic story. The basic story is that there's a bend instability. The bend instability causes a defect pair to form. The defects create vortices and the vortices create more defects. That is the dynamics of a chaotic 2D active pneumatic. And people have spent a lot of time understanding many, many things about this little theory that I have described. This theory is about uh, 10 years old now. And we know many things about this theory. Okay. Now, uh, this is just uh, the movie again. This is an actin uh, myosin uh, pneumatic. This is my Brandeis pneumatic with the microtubules and kinesin. And what I'm hoping you can see is that what you're seeing here in this movie is the phenomenology I just described. Namely that there are these defects and the plus half defects are moving and the evil defect pair is creating more defects and so on. Okay. Let's for a moment assume all of this is fine. Let me briefly summarize what we know about this system over the past 10 years of studying the equations I just described. What do we know? 
we know that there is an active stress characterized by this parameter alpha and the active stress scales with the amount of pneumatic order in any given region. We know that there are reaction stresses, namely that when I push, things push back on me. And those reaction stresses have two characteristics. They have a viscous reaction stress that comes from the Stokes equation like thing. And there is an elastic reaction stress that comes from the free energy that I was writing down in my pneumatic order parameter equation. And balancing the viscous stress, I mean, the um, action active stress with the reactive stress gives me a length scale. That length scale is square root of K over alpha, where K is the strength of pneumatic elasticity and alpha is the strength of the active stress. And this is the relevant length scale that shows up in anything you can measure. If you decided to measure how many defects are there in my system and ask what is the separation between the defects, that will be this length scale. If you decide to measure the vortices in your system and plot a vortex size distribution, it will again have the characteristic length square, square root of K over alpha. And the only speed only time scale in that problem is 1 over alpha. So anything that is a time that you can measure in the system, like mean speed in the system, the velocity autocorrelation time in the system, and so on, any time that you measure in the system has to come from this 1 over alpha guy. This is the simple theory that we have had in existence for the past 10 years or so. And recently, what we wanted to ask was, is this theory right? If it is right, what is K, eta, and alpha in my experimental system? So what I want to do now is I want to transition away from my pedagogical presentation and describe some recent work where we are trying to see if this theory is right for the experiments and what can we learn from experiments directly based on data-driven techniques. Okay. So before I switch to talk about the data-driven techniques and recent results and so on. Are there questions or comments associated with all of this horrible equations and so on? Okay, I am going to assume there are no takers, everything is fine and everybody understands everything. Uh, and now, everybody, please go ahead, Chandra. Sorry, go ahead. What were uh, I? Sorry, I'm Pune Brata. So I have one question. So uh, I think you described the phenomenology of this system, but do you have any microscopic model in mind? Uh, I mean, probably you have, but you did not talk about it. A, any well, model? any microscopic model you write down will in detail be wrong. So the way that you can derive these equations with any sense of reliability would be to say that there are force dipoles, right? And the way that you can generate a force dipole microscopically is to say that there is some reversing dynamics. So imagine that you put a velocity on a rod, but that velocity reverses rapidly. So you write a self-propelled particles with reversal. I see. So you can derive it from there. And you can, people have, so Meredith Betterton and Mike Shelley and David Santian and people like that have written down microscopic models with motors on rates, off rates, and so on to try to get this uh, extensile force dipole. But as far as we know, all of those models are to some extent wrong. I mean, whatever is happening in the real system is way more complicated. So my short answer at this time is that we don't actually know what the correct microscopic model is. Well, uh, rather, I mean, you take a microscopic model and then you'd be interested to derive the, I mean, well, derive, I mean, that might be quite complicated. Yeah, yeah, but, no, but people have done that. Where you write down a microscopic model and derive these equations, people right. have done that. So we have derived these equations for swimmer models, for example, for stroke average swimmers. We've derived these equations for these reversing rods that I was describing. And other people uh, have derived these equations with these little motor models, right? Where you have two rods and motors join and leave at some given rate and so on. And therefore, there is a force dipole and you coarse grain from there. So that you can do. Okay. So the second one uh, uh, is that uh, you talked about these velocity correlations. I mean, do you measure it here? Uh, yes. Or are there, is there any experimental measurement? Will you talk about it later? Or? Yes. I'm going to show, I'm, well, I'm not going to show you all of the details, but I'll show you the experimental data that we work with in the okay. next slide. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I will not make uh, you guys happy because I'm going to tell it very qualitatively, but I'm happy for us to cycle back and talk about it at the end. Okay. Other okay. questions or comments? Yeah, uh, uh, but no, I'm Shraddha. Go yeah. for it, Shraddha. Yeah. You are I an expert. Don't ask me questions. Yeah. So this is regarding density of pneumatic. 
Uh-huh. If this this is at very high density, I assume. Yes. If the density is low, then how interesting these dynamic will be. So, uh, for the experiments that I'm talking about, namely the cytoskeletal business, right? For the cytoskeletal system, the pneumatic description only applies at high density. The kind yes. of systems that you and I like, where there will be some phase separation, there will be some high density regions and low density regions and things like that. Those kinds of things cannot be realized in the cytoskeletal active pneumatic. It just doesn't exist because okay. the system becomes something completely different, right? Okay. But you can think about the kind of low density dynamics that you and I studied together, like when we were both young and happy, right? Those kinds of things are relevant, but in other experimental systems like motility assay systems and bacteria and things like that. And in okay. that context, okay. I don't think the defects are the key feature of the inhomogeneity. Yeah, that's right? what my question was. This defect dynamic will not be that interesting. I don't in think those. so. Because the, you, yeah. the phase separation and interface fluctuations and all of those things are so much more interesting, no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so okay. I, I, okay. I agree with you that the defects are probably boring. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Abhurna, there is one question at the chat box. Let me read okay. it out for you. Yes, it please. says, uh, what will be the effect on pneumatic order flow direction if we replace Newtonian by non-Newtonian fluids? So the flow direction would still be the same, but you will effectively be introducing another time scale in the problem. Right now on this slide, I'm saying that there is only one time scale and that is one over alpha, right? by activity but if you put some non newtonian theory like you put some elasticity in there so that you have some viscous time scale and elastic time scale in the problem then your deborah number or whatever it is you want to define for that will introduce another time scale in your problem then you can ask on the time scale at which the active stress is being exerted is the response viscous or elastic and if you probe the elastic uh, time scale with the with your active time scale then the phenomenology will be different and if you probe the if you don't probe the elastic time scale with your active time scale then the phenomenology will be like what i described so even though the flow direction will still be the same the phenomenology will be different because you are effectively introducing one more time scale in the problem okay, okay. there is another question from rupayan rupayan please go ahead so uh, my question is how do you characterize the plus up and the minus up defect that you uh, described earlier what does it mean characterize rupa uh, i mean uh, i i actually did not understand uh, what do you mean oh you are asking up, why is this one called plus half and why is that one yes, called yes, minus half yes, yes 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 okay yes, yes. okay so i don't have the cartoon in this talk and it will be embarrassing for me to go look through my files while i find the cartoon but let me try to tell roughly from what picture i have here this will not be satisfactory you need a better cartoon than that but so let's start with this rod right so in my can you see my mouse can you see my arrow yes i can yes. so if i take this rod and ask how does this rod turn as i go around this defect you should be able to see that this rod turns clockwise by 180 degrees. So because I'm turning okay. uh, clockwise, I'm turning as along a clock. I take this rod here, it turns along the clock direction a little bit, it turns along the clock direction a little bit more, continues to turn along the clock direction a little bit more and then comes back here. So you're turning clockwise and you're turning by 180 degrees. So when the rotation of the director is clockwise, that is a minus. And when the rotation of the uh, director is anti-clockwise, that is plus. That determines the sign. And the charge, the plus half is saying how much of a complete rotation is it? If you rotate it completely, if you rotate it by 360 degrees, the charge would be one. Here you're rotating by 180 degrees, so the charge is half. Now, uh, this is a little embarrassing because uh, I have a nice cartoon and a little calculation that will explain all of this, but I don't have it in this talk and I don't want to go look for it right now. So I did not answer this very satisfactorily, but I hope you got a feeling for how I would define it. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Okay. Now, I'm going to keep going because I want to show you a couple of things. I'll stop talking in five minutes. Uh, let me just show you a couple of things. Now, if I wanted to use the experimental data to understand what is happening, the experimental data is something like this. I can, I will give, somebody will give me a movie 
and I can use that movie and post process it to extract from it Q and V at every point in space at every point in time. Okay, so you can take the experimental data and you can post process it using PIV and Polescope and various other analytic techniques like that and generate from it what is the Q field at every point in space at every time and what is the velocity field at every point in space at every time. Uh, I'm sorry, this what I call, I'm calling V here, I called U in my equations on the previous uh, couple of slides. Okay. Uh, it's not very clean, but it's okay. So let's, let me just swallow my embarrassment and keep going. I have Q and V at every point in space and time. Now, if I wanted to use this data directly to describe, to find the hydrodynamic theory that this data uh, describes, what would I do? I would do something like this. I would postulate some dynamics for Q and uh, now again, it's called U instead of V. So uh, for Q and U, and it is some combination of Qs, derivatives of Qs, Us, derivatives of Us. I write down some arbitrary function. Similarly, for U, I write down some arbitrary function that contains Qs and Us and so on. And then what you can do is you can compute both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation from the data. Then you just do linear regression to identify these coefficients. You can identify these AIs and BIs and B0 and so on by doing linear regression. You just use data to generate left-hand side, use data to generate right-hand side, then you do linear regression. And only you don't do boring linear regression, you do something fancy, you do ridge regression, sparse uh, regression and things like that, some fancy linear regression to find these coefficients. This would be a technique to discover the hydrodynamic equations directly from the data without ever using my physics brain at all, right? This has been, um, uh, this technique has been called SINDI or PDE find in the applied math literature. And the papers that I'm citing here are the people who taught us how to do this. If somebody gave you a pile of data, how do you use that pile of data to discover the hydrodynamic equations from there? So what we did was we took this pile of data when we built the Cindy framework for it and asked what is the equation that the data itself suggests. And what we found is the following. Oh, one more piece of technical information. Uh, no, maybe we should skip this because we don't have time. I'll keep, skip this technical information and just talk about the ideal model. The, so I can repeat the analysis and find the ideal model from the data for different ATP concentrations. These numbers here are ATP concentrations of my system. And the equation I discovered for Q is of this form. So let's look at this equation for a moment. What the data tells me is that all of these coefficients are either minus one or one. That's where these things are. These This coefficient is minus one, this coefficient is plus one, this coefficient is uh, minus one and so on. And what this equation tells me is big relief, Galilean invariance. The data itself shows me that Galilean invariance is valid. So there's nothing, I, I have some faith in this data-driven technique because I did not tell the system anything about Galilean invariance, but the coefficients that it spit out for my equations had Galilean invariance in them. So I have some faith in that this data-driven technique is actually giving me equations that are physically right. But now, another thing that you can see is that the Q equation that I discovered using this data does not have anything that looks like the free energy, does not have any term that comes from a free energy from uh, of a pneumatic. So I can't find any pneumatic elasticity or elastic stress or anything else like that in the data. So it seems like for this experimental system, the pneumatic reaction stress is like irrelevant. The only reaction stress that is relevant is the viscous reaction stress. So that is a new piece of information that we learned by looking at the data. And of course, we were not the first people. I mean, other people have considered uh, models for active pneumatics without any pneumatic reaction stresses like in these papers. So what we found is similar to what uh, these people found. And then what we did was we found the alpha value again by fitting directly to the flow equations in the data. And we asked, how does this alpha value scale with ATP concentration? And this is the first measurement of asking what is this uh, theoretical alpha as a function of ATP concentration in my system. And I'm actually doing experiments, I'm putting a bunch of stuff in a cup. So I need to be able to state things in terms of concentrations. And here is a measurement. 
and the x axis is the alpha measurement and the y axis is the velocity autocorrelation time measurement you just take the experimental data and calculate the velocity autocorrelation time and you can see that 1 over alpha and the velocity autocorrelation time actually exactly coincide so the alpha does indeed set the time scale in my system and now i know how it changes with atp concentration right so these are some things that i can learn directly from the data okay i'm going to skip through this stuff because uh, you should have time for a conversation again skip all of this sorry i'm clicking through slides i just want to uh, uh, go back to my summary a little bit to try to tell you some of the things that we are doing right now so remember the way that i phrased the story at the beginning of the talk was saying that i want to build me one of these smart bags i want to have the same microscopic ingredients but i want to be able to build dynamic and adaptive stress so that i can get to function and i want to make materials with spatio temporally programmable active stress right but all i told you all about is this 2d active pneumatic which is a pretty boring system in which most of these things cannot be done but that was chosen for pedagogical reasons so that we can tell a story of a fully understood problem but what we've been working on recently is associated with messier systems so i have this active stress that uh, comes from these uh, microtubules and motors and so on then i have a reaction stress right that comes from the rest of the universe and this reaction stress can be viscous this reaction stress can be pneumatic elasticity and so on and as one of our uh, questioners in the conversation mentioned one could imagine that this reaction stress is not viscous but is rather viscoelastic so our experimentalists built a system where they took this microtubule thing and embedded it in an actin network so there's an entangled actin polymer gel which actually makes the environment viscoelastic then what happens is the organization of stress in the system depends on the actin concentration at low actin concentration you get a stress organization that corresponds to an extensile fluid at intermediate actin concentrations you get coexistence between something that is contractile these aster like things and the extensile fluid and at very high actin concentrations you get something that is globally contracted this is something that we are trying to understand we have a few models and a few theories that are still being played with i don't want to tell you about them because i don't quite understand them yet but uh, we're still we're working on this then another thing that i wanted to just throw out there as something that we are spending some time working on is to say i want to be able to program stress spatially and temporally means i should be able to control my motors spatially and temporally for which what our experimentalists have done is built these light activated clusters where in the presence of light the motors bind and exert forces in the absence of light they don't do anything so if there is no light there is no activity if there is light there is activity and there is force generation then what they can do is they can do experiments where they shine light only in some region maybe you can see but this video is not that great is that stuff is only moving inside the circle stuff is just static out here and what we can do is we can do theory we can do spatially varying activities and uh, build theoretical frameworks to understand how to use spatially varying activities to control the system and the control framework that we are using is called optimal control theory you can ask google what optimal control theory is it's a it's a euler lagrange framework to try to decide what should you do to your control signal to drive your system to targeted states so we built optimal control theory for active pneumatics and we are playing with it right now okay those are all just coming attractions things that we are doing and of course there is a bag all of this stuff needs to be put in a bag to make a smart bag so we're also putting active stuff inside bags and asking how does the stiffness of the bag change the properties of what is happening when does the bag move and things like that this is a published work movie from a published work but there's a lot more happening here and there will be you know two three papers over the next few months that will come out on properties of the bag okay i know i'm out of time i just want to put the, this picture up to say that these former students did most of the work that i showed you today this guy is the one that's working on the optimal control aspects this is a former postdoc who did a bunch of the work i showed you today and these are current postdocs working on composites and cindy and stuff like that and these are my collaborators who not only give me experimental data but help me understand whatever it is that is happening and these are the people who gave money okay now i will stop sharing screen if i can find the button and we can
uh, talk for a minute. Is this okay? Thanks, Apurna, for this very nice presentation. I already see some raised hand. Raghu, please go ahead. Raghu, ask your question. I think he might be muted or something. I'm not able to hear him. I can't hear him either. Raghu, you figure out why we are not able to hear you? Oh, I see you now. Why are you muted? You have a penguin icon and whatnot. No, he's not muted, but somehow we are not able to hear him. <coughs> ah, okay. Okay, Raghu, please figure out what is wrong at your end. Anybody? Huh? Ah, Achha, okay. Yeah, he's going to ask later. Uh, so, anybody else? <coughs> Unnabrato, you had a follow-up question, you said? Oh, I see. No. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you already showed that velocity correlation, uh, but you plotted, uh, I didn't understand. What is the x-axis or something? Uh, oh, so the x-axis was ATP concentration. The y-axis on this side was the time scale for the velocity autocorrelation. You just mm, plot the velocity autocorrelation function and ask what is the exponential time scale for it, right? Uh, I see. No, so you are, uh, I mean, uh, say if we plot, say, uh, as a function of time, I mean, time time correlation. Yes. So, uh, I did not show you the velocity velocity autocorrelation function itself, right? Just believe me when I say the velocity velocity autocorrelation function decays as a function of time. And I'm just extracting the time constant. That is what I showed you. You are assuming that it's exponential. It is quite exponential. The envelope is exponential. There is some oscillations because there is uh, vorticity in my problem, but the envelope is quite exponential. No, but the uh, picture or the movies uh, you showed, I mean, it seems that, uh, I mean, I think there was uh, another question by uh, one uh, from audience uh, that you see, see large scale fluctuations and cooperativity. I mean, so I naively expect that it would be long range or something, but you are saying yeah, that it's, it's not exponential. so because i mean i'm showing you a zoomed in movie of this little region it looks all ordered and cooperative and so on if you zoom out and look at the whole movie it's just some chaotic mess uh, i see okay uh, but in the i think uh, i don't know caprini uh, all and they i think did something on this uh, velocity autocorrelation in active uh, active matter system right uh, and I, I think they found long range correlation or uh, am i wrong or long range that, space uh, uh, yeah i think time they i think uh, long range in time means polar order right everybody is going in the same direction yeah maybe but uh, okay. so i, I think it would be a different uh, system right uh, if i had polar ordering if i had like velocity all oriented everybody going in the same time so that the long time velocity velocity autocorrelation function actually goes to a constant instead of zero that would be polar right yeah okay we are dealing with pneumatics uh, here they're not going anywhere there is no net flow but still there are fluctuations i mean okay uh, i don't know what long range fluctuations in time means all, you're saying delta all, v of t all. delta v of t prime doesn't go to zero no, it goes to zero very, very slowly, power law, as a power law. Ah, it delta v of t, delta v of zero uh, goes as t to the power some right. alpha. Uh, something, yeah. Ah, okay. So those are not the kind of statistics you find in the active pneumatics. I don't okay. know which paper you're thinking about. It's possible for us to have screwy power law correlations in these systems, right? It's very easy to cook up those kinds of things. It's, oh. It just so happens that in the experimental data that I'm working with, it's not true. But I don't know uh, which models you're thinking about. There are all kinds of screwy models where you can get these very crazy things. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll think about I apologize. Thing. I don't know the paper that no, you're no, mentioning, no. so I can't actually yeah. know. No, I think there are some uh, more works. I mean, even in act active uh, Brownian particles, they measure this velocity uh, autocorrelation function. Uh, I don't remember. ABPs Maybe don't power. have uh, exponential, don't have power law correlations in time. ABP models don't have power law correlations in time. Okay. Must be uh, some other model because a simple ABP model does not have power law correlations in time. 
velocity velocity you mean velocity velocity uh, the abp simple abp model is rather well defined and the einstein ulenbeck is also well defined and you are saying they are all uh, exponential decay in time yes uh huh okay the okay. time dependent non equilibrium steady state is not that uh, screwy there is lots of so the thing that happens when you have velocity velocity autocorrelation function that becomes power law is that your system is no longer extensive right because you have to wait arbitrarily long times for you to actually get a statistically well defined ensemble average of anything in that non equilibrium steady state yeah so it's a very very screwy system and there are screwy systems and there is all kinds of interesting things that people can study in those screwy systems but abp is not one of them mm -hmm. so okay. uh, uh, thank you i but but now can you hear me now go for it rago oh okay uh, so i had this so initially in your uh, theoretical model you wrote down the hydrodynamic equations based on physical intuition right and then yes Uh, it describes the correct physics of these dynamics, and I, I, I think you probably have also quantified certain things and so on. So why then? I mean, instead of maybe improving on those equations, why do you have to re-derive this from the data? I mean, don't oh, we? Well, the the reason that I was trying to re-derive it from the data was just to see if those equations are actually true, right? One of the things is that uh, if if I decide that this is the right lens. which is what we always did when we were me measuring things from the data for example uh, us christina marchetti luca jomi all of these people have played with this data and made measurements right plotted the velocity velocity um, i mean the vortex distribution plotted the defect distribution things like that in all of those analysis we assumed the model was true and then um, used the statistical properties obtained i mean statistical information obtained from the experiment to identify the length scales what our data driven analysis showed us was that our assumption that this model is right is not is shaky because there is no pneumatic free energy this thing is completely no so the length scale the one the square root of 1 over alpha length scale is a non linear emergent length scale it's not coming by a balance of viscous stress with the pneumatic elasticity that was the new piece that we found but you're right that for the 2d active pneumatic this is boring it's like using a bulldozer to crack a peanut the reason we built the bulldozer was to crack other problems which we are working on right now we just used it on the peanut because we know how to crack a peanut so let's use it there does that make sense okay, we're yeah, using thanks, this thanks. data driven yeah. analysis for all kinds of systems where we have no idea what the theory is yeah yeah and i have a slightly different question also so mm -hmm. this experimental system that you described the interaction is very clear it's pneumatic there are you have rod like or filament like uh, interaction um but if you take some other systems for example epithelial cells and so on there also you see this uh, pneumatic defects like plus half and minus half yes. so is it true to say that just looking at the defects can we infer that the interaction is pneumatic like is it is it that is right? the claim right i think I that is the claim i don't know how robust that claim is but it's kind of inevitable right the uh, defects are the perfect uh, uh perfect probe of symmetry right 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 because the reason that uh, the plus minus half defect is the lowest uh, defect charge that you can get in the system is profoundly based on symmetry right so it mm -hmm. seems like it's reasonable to say that if i see a plus minus half defect pair that must be pneumatic at least in my head it sounds like a reasonable thing to do okay okay thank you thank you Okay, uh, there were a couple of questions in chat and some raised hands. Shakuntala, yes, you are. The... A, yeah, I'm keeping track of them. There was a raised hand from Navneet who has again lowered his hand. Have you already got the answer to your question, or do you want to ask? Navneet Singh. Okay, uh, then Onirvan, please go ahead. Sorry, this. Sorry, this is rather a. um pedagogic sort of question so in all these uh, pneumatic theories i see the active forces uh, the the active stress you take them to be trace less is there a profound reason for that or is it just there a is, yeah there is no profound reason for that 
So, for example, if you take the version of these active nematic theories that is written down by the swimmer people, right? If you take uh, Ishikawa and Pedley or you take uh, Shelley and the many Shelley babies and stuff like that, they don't assume tracelessness. They actually keep the active stress to be this uh, dipolar thing and do not enforce tracelessness. Meaning, meaning does tracelessness has to do with some unidirectional motion that is being put in by uh, that uh -huh. player? I don't think it's any of that. It's just that how many independent cells, let us define the dipolar stress as this matrix, right? And let us not enforce tracelessness so on the matrix at all. Huh? Minimal number of parameters. Minimal number of parameters. So basically okay. you ask what are the linearly independent ways that I can represent this matrix. And the linearly independent ways you can represent this matrix as a symmetric traceless plus a trace. Okay. Right. And it turns out that that plus a trace cannot do anything when your system is incompressible. That's why the swimmer people, even though they never have tracelessness in the way they write down the active stress, end up in exactly the same equations that the active pneumatics people get end up in when they have traceless active stress. Because the trace cannot do anything in an incompressible system. It just goes and changes the definition of the pressure, which you can't measure anyway. Okay. So that is the reason. I, there's no profound reason. It's stupid. It's an accident of wherever people are coming from. But it turns out that if the system is incompressible, you can't tell the difference. Okay. So there is a, another question in the chat box from Arpan Sinha. He says that you mentioned some chaotic behavior in active pneumatics. How does one characterize this in pneumatic systems? How to characterize chaotic behavior in pneumatic systems? So I assume characterize chaotic behavior in active pneumatics is what you're thinking about. And the way that people characterize it is they say, okay, let me first of all take the velocity as the metric in which I'm going to look for chaos. And they measure the power spectrum of the velocity. So what people who do traditional chaos, traditional turbulence in fluids do, is they take the power spectrum of the velocity autocorrelation and then they say, oh, this power spectrum has a power law behavior. Like we were talking about in time here, the power law behavior will be in space. So the power, power spectrum will scale as k to some exponent. And then you say, oh, the Kolmogorov exponent must be this or that or whatever. And then you compare the exponents that you get from the power spectrum for the active pneumatic with the power spectrum that you get from classical turbulence. The cleanest exposition of this kind of a calculation is in a recent paper. Uh, last author is Giovanni. I am forgetting the name of the postdoc who's the first author in that paper. It's very nicely explained how to think about chaos and how to think about power spectra and stuff like that. This paper is like from two years ago. Very, very nice paper. So I'm not an expert on this and it doesn't get me very excited to measure power spectra and stuff, but that's what people do. I don't see any other raised hands and I okay. think we have addressed all the points, uh, questions asked in the chat box. So right. if there is no more question, thank you Aparna once more for first of all, getting up so early in the morning and <laughs> giving this very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.